Good evening and welcome to VI Voices. I'm Emil Henderson III along with Clint Ferris and Yogi Hanley. Boy McFarlane has a night off. We are here as we continue our election coverage and tonight we have as our special guest Kenneth Mapp who is running for the office of governor in the 2014 general election. He's no stranger to politics as he has served as a senator and has also served as a lieutenant governor. And this will not be the first time that he is running for the gubernatorial seat, but um, he will be on the show tonight and we'll have an opportunity to question him and ask him certain questions so that you have an opportunity to know whether or not that is a candidate for you. But we will begin tonight as we do every show night, Hot Topics. And the first thing we want to do is once again, he is a five-time champion. And so our very own Tim Duncan has, with the, with the San Antonio Spurs, has won the 2014 NBA championships and we are so very proud of him here in the territory and you know we've had a lot of talk about this and whether or not um, this is something that we all should be proud of being that he is a Crucian a native son and, and I think we should be because he has accomplished something that is beyond what any regular person um, can accomplish and, and especially in the, in the NBA as yeah. a basketball player um, considering one of the best um, of his time, mm -hmm. or generally in, in, in the NBA. What are your thoughts on that? No, Tim Duncan is going to go down in history as one of the best, and I think one of the best power forward. I think he's going to do off um, Karl Malone, because Karl Malone hasn't won a ring. He's going to do off Charles Barkley. He's going to go down in history as one of the best power forward in, at his position, because right. you have to think about a position, cause he, and he's going to be compared to his contemporaries, because as, as, a sport, as a sport enthusiast, I already compared him to his contemporaries because right. I'm looking at the class that he came out with. I'm looking at people like he played with, Allen Iverson, Kobe Bryant. And I think the only person within his class that you can actually even look at in terms of greatness is Kobe Bryant. Because uh -huh. nobody else within that 97, 98 has the amount of rings nor the amount of um, personal accomplishment and success right, right. other than Kobe Bryant. Right, and right. I'm a Laker fan, so I have to plug that one into <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> what are your thoughts, Yoki? Well, I'll be honest. Where I'm are the Lakers? I'm sorry, where no. are they? Um, excuse are me? they still playing? Where are the Lakers? Excuse that's, me. That's are they still, the Lakers? They still in thing? That's what you we're say. In, I, I'm like we're in, La, we're in Los Angeles. <laughs> we have 16 banners flying high in the Great Western, no, actually, we call it the, um, the Staples Center. So please, I, I was just we wondering. are going to give Tim Duncan and his Spurs all due, all the respect and all, all the confetti right now. Uh -huh. But next season, we will be back. But this is Tim Duncan's moment. Let's go to Yoki. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yoki, your thoughts? Well, to be honest, I haven't been an avid basketball fan in about 20 years. Um, what I do like with this team, which I've been, you know, um, following, is that they actually perform as a team. Right. And that's part of the reason why I stopped following basketball is because you have too many superstars, and it just act individually. Exactly, you know, and, and it's supposed to be a team effort. And with Spurs, I see um, Clint watch me like. <laughs> but I'm I'm, I'm Yeah, she's talking about your team. Yeah, even and let me tell you, Clint, I was nobody was a bigger Lakers fan than me. Nobody was a Lakers fan. Purple and gold. The Lakers were nice until Shelby hey, Kobe arrived. Yeah. Hey, excuse me. And when she showed up. Excuse me. Excuse me. This is all it. about Tim Duncan. We yes, gotta, don't worry about Kobe, the great one. Whatever. The only other one that has been compared to Michael Jordan in his time. So please, get off of Kobe's back. Focus on Timmy. And that's all we're going to do. You know, Leave I, Kobe I, alone. I, you never heard that name come out my mouth. So you see what's what happens. But well, you know what's so ironic? You be talking about basketball and you talking about selfers and whatnot. But when Michael Jordan was playing, everybody was loving a Michael Jordan. But what, and now Kobe comes along. But we hate Michael Kobe. Jordan wasn't as grandiose with it as Kobe was. Grandiose? Yeah, Kobe was Did annoying. he yeah. change all the rules for Michael Jordan? What rules were changed? Excuse me. The Jordan <laughs> rules. <laughs> the New York Knicks were denied the I championship just because of Michael Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> David Stern ruined the NBA. He made change the NBA totally for Michael Jordan. But so don't get what? me started. Okay. Let's focus but, on Tim Duncan, the great number 21. Let's, yes, let's focus, let's on, focus on, on our Kushan Bond. You know, we do yes. have other Kushan Bond basketball players who I'm sure right. in time will rise up to that status. Yes. You know, we and, have and, and, and in other sports, you have Lil Rock yes. a lot of other sports. Correct. Jackson's um, Correct. Um, children from the Virgin Isles who also are in boxing. And so we have a lot of Roger Bell yes. who also plays basketball. His and sister Tumbi plays for the WNBA as so well. So we have a lot of people in sports from the Virgin Islands who are doing wonderful things. and. 
Um, but you know, we're very proud of Timmy and, and, and glad that he has been able to achieve all that he's achieved. And that yes. he's such a gentleman about and it. I think that's what's, what's me. More and humble. Hey. Yes. And humble. And congratulations to Timmy. Unlike, yes. unlike the other one. I but like speaking that. about speaking about um, grandiose, the budget. I don't even. Yeah, let's talk about the governor's fiscal year 2015 budget. Okay, I don't understand it. Hey. So maybe you can make some headway hey. as to what this I budget is about. I couldn't make any headway because mm -hmm. trust me, I, honestly, when Mini Me goes before the legislature and dominates, when who? Mini Me, Deborah Gatley, oh, oh, Mini <laughs> Me, she goes in front of that leg, and I mean, come on. Somebody have to tell her, excuse me, ma'am. You don't get to ask us questions. We get to ask you questions. And all you need to do is provide us with the answer. You don't, you don't need to give us anecdotal information. Let us know what's going on. Tell us what much money we have. The formulas, the projection, and let us know, truly. But she's operating on, on, on the high master's uh, marching orders. But again, what's so... Well, make no I'm not secret the, that the... Director of OMB is probably the most powerful person in our government. Correct. That's who controls who gets their money mm -hmm. and who doesn't get their money. Mm -hmm. But last week we talked about this issue mm -hmm. and we talked about the fact that the legislature has a way of, of or at least an avenue to clip her way. Advocate, yeah. And yeah. that is only pass a budget that matches the revenue. Correct. And then when you do that, she has to give you the money that the, that the, the legislature appropriates. But when you over-appropriate, then, you just then she gets to decide who gets their money and when. Correct, but at times, most of the information is they take on face value. They ask the questions, and truthfully, most of the legislators don't understand the budget process, not even what's inside of the budget. Well, that's not good. No, and what, so we need to, so that's the problem. So my thing about it is, what are they appropriating? Do they truly know what they're appropriating? Mm -hmm. But how can they know if they're not even getting that information? That's the problem. Because I think for the past, at least from since the beginning of this legislature, I've always heard the They've complaint. always received the budget late. Late. Submission late. Which so would give them time to, to review the, it. And the, then they're asking for, for information, information, access, information. Right, access to the accounts and whatnot. And they've uh, been rejected, denied every step of the way. But, so. then, but then they go and start to grandstand, start to question the commissioners. Oh, what do you need? What do you need? No. Your governor sent down this budget. Well, this is what we're going to pass. Based on what your governor sent down, we're not going to atta at attach anything extra. And now, my thing too is, where is the, when you question, when the budget comes down, then don't you ask the question, like for instance, Department of Education. Mm -hmm. Where's the where's the line item for maintenance for each of the schools? Mm -hmm. Shouldn't that be a part of the budget when it comes for forward? Certain things that are, should be a part of the budget cycle is not. It would only make it clearer. Yes. Um, for everybody to understand what's happening, what's going on, definitely make that clearer. And, and there'll be a true picture of what monies we'd have or what monies we are projected in terms of collecting and and truthfully have have this administration been honest That's because in terms of tax collection and, and revenues that have been coming in to the government and i think i've not seen a true picture from this particular administration i don't think we've ever had a true picture no. of our actual finances um from this financial team um, that goes to legislation and the legislation each time will accept whatever it is comes to them or really what it is I'm not sure if it's an acceptance it's they a lack of follow-up so they ask a question and they usually say well we don't really know the answer to that we'll give it to you later but then the later never, never comes. comes and so they end up passing and doing all these different things that doesn't match the true financial picture of our government no, but so they're it, like an old dog with no teeth yeah, but the see but I, I mean the statement you made that the legislators truly don't know what's going on Oh, I didn't know. No, that's they, not they what made I said. a statement prior to that about uh -huh. they, they don't have a true picture at times. Right. But at times. Ever. Yeah, but Senator Hansen public, pub, published a policy ad yesterday. Mm -hmm. And a, 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 big, a big portion of her ad was about the RT Park and one. I think it was so the Sunday Monday paper. And I was a bit taken aback because she was saying the governor did this, the governor did that, but truthfully. And that she didn't vote. Thank Correct. you. That's what my, my question. Everybody Most gets, of the time, she voted. Gets. The eight percent cut. The senator says that. Yes, the senator didn't vote because she chose to be absent and said she had a um, business someplace else. So she was pulling a bashinger then. <laughs> well, remember, she keeps in touch with her people. Correct. Oh, okay. And, and so, she guys her people. And so, I guess all you have to do is keep in touch, but whether if, whether you're keeping in touch accurately or not. But if you look at it, one of the things that, especially a lot of these senators who are running for either for their office again or for high office, 
is going to use this particular moment in history to grandstand, to try to curry favor from the people. I and we, that. the people, need to let them know, stop it. And that's what we do here, um, by asking the, the pertinent questions for them to answer the questions and help you all to get a feel of, of what it is that they're saying, whether or not they're giving you truthful answers or they're just giving you the kind of answers that you're saying grandstanding. Because kind of like what happened in the 2000 eight elections Correct. with with um president bush where it was almost like anybody but hey look at the eight years we've had was a disaster mm -hmm. speak anti whatever happened in those eight years people who want to come and say let's speak anti what happened these last eight years are those who we may a lot of people may gravitate to because they want to see something that's different and so we have to be careful not to be duped by people who are going to say to us i'm not him or we won't have right. that kind of administration and in other words we cannot vote for brother Kiat. My brother, cat may not necessarily be better than what we have right now. Hey, I, honestly, I, no, no, I'm looking forward to I'm looking forward to the show that I can actually put my opinion out there, pick my seven, pick my gubernatorial team, and let the people know what how, how I am thinking. Well, you do that after the primary. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, hopefully, yeah. we'll be able to do that after and the primary. And of course, primary. No, but that's the problem. And that's my question. Is there a democratic primary taking place? Well, we'll have to ask a Democrat no, because when they come on the show. Come next week, we're doing senators but for the, the Democratic Party. And so when they come up, we'll ask them, is that, are, I, you in a, are you in a primary? Because, because I mean, we I'm haven't saying, heard anything. You're right. The gubernatorial candidates are, are not doing anything. No fish fry, no this, no that. Oh, I, I, I tell a fish fry. They're taking the people for granted. Well, well they're feeding the people. Well, let's, we have on our show tonight, <laughs> Mr. Kenneth Mapp. And um, I, I'm... I'm certain that people are going to watch this show and hear what he has to say about his run again for the 2014 election and ask a bunch of questions of him. I'm sure you're going to ask a bunch of questions and you're going to ask a bunch of questions and I'll just be the buffer again. Um, and, but I think I still ask some questions. But he's here tonight and he's here to answer questions and hopefully convince you as to why he should be your candidate in the 2014 election. So when we return, we'll have Kenneth Mapp back in a moment. Good evening and welcome back to VI Voices. We have with us tonight Mr. Kenneth Mapp. Good evening. Good evening. How are you doing? I am well, thank you. This is your first time on VI Voices. Yes, it is. Hopefully it's not the first time you've seen the show. No, it's not. Very <laughs> good. <laughs> because I want to tell you, then you have to come off now. <laughs> um, I, I know I was about to say, I know I was going to say, I don't think I could see the show from this seat. Correct. Okay. Correct. So <laughs> it's good that, that you're here tonight because we here at VI Voices have what we call our Rocket Voice campaign where we are trying to educate our entire community on the issues um, and to educate them on the individuals who are asking for their vote so they understand how important their vote is. Yeah. And so what we try to do is have people on the show ask questions of them so they can give their full responses and honest, hopefully honest responses to them. So what we start off usually doing is giving you an opportunity to introduce yourself for those who may not know who you are um, and let us know a little bit about your campaign and where you're going before we start you know, sure. crushing it. Sure. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm Ken Mapp, and I have a long history of public service here in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Uh, started off literally in the Virgin Islands as a school monitor, first set, through the police department as a police officer, uh, into the legislature, head of the uh, local union, president of the PVA, uh, served in the legislature, got elected lieutenant governor, served as commissioner of insurance, and chairman of the banking board and the head of the Department of Licensing and Consumer Affairs. Uh, went off, got my master's degree in public administration from the Kennedy School of Government, came back, uh, served as the director of finance and administration of the Public Finance Authority under Governor Turnbull, and did about four good stints in the private sector. Uh, I, I'm a public servant, long, long career of, of being on the public stage and really trying to help the people of the Virgin Islands. I'm in my fourth gubernatorial race, but my third run uh, for governor. I ran and was successful with uh, Governor Roy Schneider in, back in 1994. Uh, I've asked the former Senator Osbert Potter uh, 
uh, who has agreed to run with me as independent candidates in this race. As you know, Osbert has uh, a long distinguished career again in the public sector, 23 years as a commission officer in the Virgin Islands National Guard, served two terms in the legislature of the Virgin Islands, commissioner of the Department of Licensing and Consumer Affairs, and uh, recently uh, 10 years as the executive director of the Virgin Islands Public Broadcast System, and I think many people will know him territorially. He lived on St. Croix, that's part of his tenure in the National Guard, but I think uh, people recognize his recent work in seeing how he brought such a, a, a local flavor and the culture and the history of the Virgin Islands into public broadcast, into the public broadcast system. And, 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 and very happy to, to, to have him as, on the team as a partner. And we have what we believe is a very energetic um, vision about what we need to be doing in the next era of governance in the Virgin Islands. We completely recognize that uh, the next administration cannot, if the people of the Virgin Islands are to move to a better quality of life, cannot simply buy into the way we simply do things, pick up the mantle uh, on Inauguration Day and just simply run the track uh, like it's another uh, four or eight year run, but fundamentally how we are going to bring knowledge-based technology opportunity in terms of challenging or meeting the challenges that were confronted here in the Virgin Islands as it regards to the high cost of living the lack of opportunity. Over a thousand students will graduate or are graduating this month from all of the high schools in the Virgin Islands and I dare say more than 80 percent of them will be leaving the Virgin Islands and many more of, of, of those, a big number out of those, will have no opportunity to come back to the Virgin Islands and work after their education or serving in the military or going to trade and vocational school because we haven't provided a environment, an environment under which uh, opportunity can grow and the investment we're making in our young people that they can put them back in our community. The challenges of the healthcare system, the high cost of energy, and I know we're going to discuss a lot of those issues, but our vision for the Virgin <coughs> Islands is to really uh, implement a, a energetic strategic plan and how we can measure our progress, hold folks accountable, and to begin this process of, of developing uh, an environment in the Virgin Islands where the quality of life is improved and the delivery of public service becomes tangible uh, and real. And on that basis, we have uh, solidified a slogan for this campaign called A Time to Build, which can follow us into an administration and be used as a measuring stick on our progress or failure or our just quagmire of not being able to, to move anything. Now, one of the things that I think the, the public is going to want to hear is this is, as you indicated, this is your third run yes. as a gubernatorial candidate, which you ran twice before one successful. Why would you want to run, let the people know, why would you want to run a third time? Um, and what, what is your reason this time that you feel it makes it a little different? Well, I'm young enough to begin. Uh, the reality is that I care. Uh, I started my public career in politics, getting elected on my 27th birthday. I'll be 59 in a few months, uh, so I've been doing this for quite a while. And I think that while I must say I, I had some hesitancy about making the run again uh, and, and looking within myself and asking myself is maybe my time, the relevance of my philosophy and my time might have, that window may have closed. Um, but as you see the deterioration of the quality of life, the lack of resources in the territory, the challenges that people are facing. Many, many folks in the community um, asked me if I was running, and I, I discussed a lot of my hesitancy. And, and, and I recall well <laughs> when I said to folks that maybe I'm just not relevant anymore. People thought it was time for me to say Bronco. <laughs> and and <laughs> asked me, you know, and asked me to demonstrate in a very real way that if you care, you've got to care not only in the good times, you have to care in the very bad times and that my, uh, my, the demonstration of my public record in the past is very much needed at a time like this. And without pointing fingers, there's so much that's not working in the Virgin Islands, well in the Virgin Islands. And some of it is so broken that it can't be fixed. 
So you get the opportunity to build. And building provides a lot better results over fixing. And so it's a time when Azmat Pada and I can really look to the Virgin Islands community and demonstrate how we ought to be doing things differently, how a cabinet ought to look, how agency heads ought to be respected, how they ought to be held accountable for their responsibility, how we drive in the public sector a lot of the skill and the value that we have and give people the opportunity to shine and begin to reward people on merit and recognize that if we don't function in the public sector in a reasonable way, people in this community suffer. Mr. And we have to be able to make that connection. Mr. Mapp, um, to this point in the Virgin Islands history, there have not been a, a, a leader or a politician that has come before the people that has been more vilified and, and, than yourself. And I believe you have been tarred and feathered over the last 20 odd years. Now, how do you convince the people that they need to look beyond those emotions and invest in you and your administration? Well, I think the people of the Virgin Islands have actually treated me very well. Um, I, I think that I have been honored. I am humbled for the many positions of trust that I have been afforded, the opportunities that I have been given, and I think to a great respect, whether folks like me or don't like me, or whether folks will vote for me or don't vote for me, I share a distinction that's not widely shared in the political community. And the distinction that I share from the people of the Virgin Islands is that my capacity for work and my understanding of the issues and my ability to listen and respond in an appropriate way, mm -hmm. I am humbled by that admiration across political lines, across the diversity of the community. So the treatment and the respect that the people of the Virgin Islands have afforded me far outshines, and the opportunities that they've given me far outshines the vilification. Mm -hmm. You are vilified when you do things that change circumstances, because in every circumstance there is a beneficiary and then there's someone struggling. And in my 32 years of service, I, I suspect there are many people could sit down and say, over this decision, I disagreed. Over that decision, I didn't like it. Over the others. And so vilification is part of the portfolio. Mm -hmm. The question is, has the benefit and the contributions to this territory and to the people of the Virgin Islands with respect to the measurement of the quality of work that I've been able to work with others and delivered over the 32 years, have they far surpassed the vilification? Have I survived five public audits uh, of the entities that I've managed in the government and nobody has asked me yet, where's our money? In, in public projects, in public finance, in the Lieutenant Governor's office, at the Department of Licensing and Consumer Affairs. And so I, I, I think that I, I take the plenty good Mm -hmm. with a little bit of, of the vilification. What I like to listen to is when folks provide constructive criticism. If you live on a public stage, they're going to throw eggs at you. All right. And if you don't get thrown, if they don't throw some eggs at you, you got no business on the public stage because you're not changing anything. So I, I think we need to hear the criticism that are legitimate, that people cry out, and learn and adjust our lives and the way we manage and the way we do our work so that it continues to benefit the people. And we look at the, uh, the noise from the peanut gallery and give it an accorded whatever attention it, it, we may think it's due. Okay. Uh, in, um, in 2010, I believe you offered a better way of doing things than your opponents. In 2014, what are some of the things that your administration is going to champion starting 2015 if you're well, elected? Well, in 2006 and 2010, mm. in, the, in those conversations and some discussions in between, in some of the appearances I made at the legislature to testify on certain of the, what I thought were the largest scale issues that have ramifications affecting the territory, I think the discussion doesn't change much. Because just as an example, in 2010, when we talked about the diversification, when Dr. Sikou and I spoke about the diversification 
of energy production in the Virgin Islands and the need to grapple immediately the problem of the rising cost of energy because of how it affected the economy, your current your power bill was 26 cents a kilowatt hour. Mm. Today, four years later, your power bill is 52 cents a kilowatt hour, meaning that today a gallon of milk in the Virgin Islands is $14. A loaf of bread is $7. And, and, and it drives the cost of everything uh, as far as doing business in the Virgin Islands, as far as raising families, as far as just subsisting. And, and many of those issues are, are the same. In 2006 and 2010, we spoke in a very dramatic way on this whole process of the uncompensated care of our health division, our hospitals and clinics, and providing services uh, to folks who, who are unable to pay and how we need to deal with, with that problem. And here comes the Affordable Care Act that really provides us a wonderful opportunity. So we talked about that. We talked about reforms of public education and the importance. As far back as 2006, uh, Senator Leibert and I spoke about this whole issue of working with the unions, the AFTs, and the teachers. And we even offered then and people thought it was a gimmick. We offered then a minimum increase in the base pay for teachers at $10,000 for teachers who were certified, $5,000 for who were not, and they would get the remaining upon certification. And then how we wanted to reform public education by getting teachers, principals, and parents to run schools in a, in a manner that is similar to a charter school system by dividing the budget of public education by the pupils and letting the money follow the children where they went and stop saying that if you lived in Mumbiju, you had to go to this school. If, 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 if Alfredo Andrews appeared to parents to be doing a better job than a school in Hashkash and you wanted to bring your child to that school, you should be able to do that because then you get the schools to have a, competit a competition where you get to drive resources. We've got to focus public education and this is why getting working with the unions are important. We have to focus public education not on meeting our annual uh, uh, statistics or, or goals, our yearly progress reports, but on the proficiency of our students. In 2007, only uh, we, ha we had an AYP, uh, uh, annual yearly progress target, that 22% of, of third graders had to read at the third grade level. It's 2007, 2008. That's one in five third graders should be reading on the third grade level. In 2014, we still haven't achieved that goal. And we know what that means at junior high, we know what that means at ninth grade, we know what that means at 10th grade. So if we don't do fundamental reforms to how we teach, and maybe I, I, I may get in, in somewhat of a, a problem here, but I think science has demonstrated that children of color learn differently than children that not, are not of color. They hear music differently, their experiences are differently, and so to properly communicate and teach, there has to be a fundamental different way on how we approach that. Jeffrey Canada in New York City is reforming an entire borough called Brooklyn in public education through a process that he had been talking about for the last 10 years. And we're seeing the results of that. So we've got to be a little bit courageous. We've got to sit with, with the folks that drive education, which are our educators and their unions, and we have to have a fundamental conversation on how we focus our efforts and focus our resources that they materialize in a better proficient student. Now, so Senator, one, one, one of the things that I've talked about on the show continually is the importance of me hearing yes. the plan. Yes. And, and it's really nice to talk in flowery language and to talk about the abstract of certain yes. things. I know you just discussed a lot of stuff that you did in 2006 and your thought processes in 2010. But what I want the audience to, to, to get, well, to hear, is now in 2014, as you're running with Mr. Potter, yes. what exactly is the plan to do the things that you've now talked about yes. in 2006 and 2010? So what is your plan uh, for us to deal with 52 cents a kilowatt? What is your plan for us to deal with our health care? Sure. The fact that our hospitals are in complete disarray. What is your plan? I think I kind of heard your plan for education, but what is your plan for those sure. who are on the GRS who may not have any money in, in, in a couple who, of who, years? Who is not now enjoying a secured Correct. retirement? Correct. Yes. So let's start off first with energy and the 52 yes. cents a kilowatt. Energy, energy. Once again, the, 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 the solution to the energy problem 
isn't a complex one. It is about the diversifying energy production. In 06 and 2010, primarily producing electricity on number four, number six diesel. Very expensive way to produce energy, less than 1% of electrical production in America on, on that commodity. The, what the Water and Power Authority is talking about and doing and their $100 million investment, I made it my business to go to many of the regulatory hearings, sit in the back of the rooms, listen, get the material, read on it, is this diversification of using natural liquid propane gas. The cost of liquid propane gas and diesel, the, the difference between the two prices, is quite significant. WAPA, to its credit, did enter into some hedge agreements, which before the horrible winter that we just experienced, that drove the price of liquid propane gas up, were not affected by that because the hedge agreements would protect them. Their attempt to reduce energy costs by some 30% or the fuel cost by 30% is really very realistic because we spend about $250 million a year in the territory only on the oil to run the generators. Now, there are several factors and things that are happening that are gonna help us get to a further reduction. We uh, believe, and, and I in particular believe, that we now need to enter the use of clean coal in the equation of diversifying the energy. It is a very cheap commodity. We have already achieved the, the environmental protection standards and the scrubbers. Coal remains in America still the largest single producer of electrical costs in the nation, and we're talking about six to nine cents a kilowatt hour. The ash is extremely recyclable, and, and, and the coal-fired plant on St. Croix, the ship bring the coal in, takes the ash back out. So we need to continue to diversify the, the commodities by which we use, we produce electricity. But it gives us another opportunity. You can't store electricity. So you got 10, 20, 30 megawatt producing plants. As, you, as people come off the grid or reduce their power consumption, WAPA cannot adjust their power production to meet to the reduced level of demand. So they're still producing up here. They're still burning the oil up here. We're still paying the liak up here. When you go to diversification, you then are allowed to use, you get the opportunity to use smaller capacity generators, five megawatts, six megawatts, whatever the number is, and begin to implement some efficiencies in the production of electricity as people come down off the grid, you're able to reduce uh, your power production because you can't store it. What the discussion in the territory is, and, and it's going to heat up as the year goes along, is that there's some belief that we should cap people going on renewable energy. The cost of the infrastructure on renewable energy is coming down, so it's putting that uh, tool in the hand of many more people. And what we're saying is that the benefits of net metering are so eroding the revenue basis of the Water and Power Authority that somehow we should cap it and sunset the program, as opposed to having the conversation, where do we want to be with energy production in the Virgin Islands five years from now, 10 years from now, and get the Water and Power Authority and the public policy community to understand this whole issue of renewable energy is no different than the conversation of when we had landlines and cell phones were coming into being, and the major telephone companies had to recognize if they weren't able to adjust and switch, they simply were gonna go out to business. And the same thing is going to happen with energy production. All across America, private and public energy producers are scrambling trying to figure out how do we hold people on the grid? We, we, we can't let them go because we're losing revenue. And as the cost of the, the infrastructure to get to renewable energy becomes achievable in your home, in your business, in other homes and businesses, nobody's going to stick around paying 52, paying 38 uh, a cents a kilowatt hour. One addition that's important, the Government Development Bank of Puerto Rico recently, in the end of the year, a report on a strategy for the revitalization and growth of the Puerto Rico economy. And just as a, as a backdrop, the Government Development Bank in Puerto Rico in its history has financed more than 80% of the branded hotels you see in Puerto Rico. In fact, the Government Development Bank at one time owned the Ritz-Carlton in Puerto Rico and in 2005 sold it to the private sector. So its opinion in the discussion of the economy of Puerto Rico is seen as very important. And it listed one of the items that it listed as an obstacle to get to economic revitalization and growth was the cost of energy in Puerto Rico. 
which is 21 to 24 cents a kilowatt hour. So if, if at that cost, you really can't build an economy, you have a difficulty building an economy, how are we going to build one even at 30 some cents a kilowatt hour with the, with the savings that WAPA may be able to achieve given the conversion and the use of liquid propane gas? So we have to do er further um, uh, diversification of energy productions. I am for the use of renewable energy, but anyone that studies the issue at the level that we have studied it recognizes that if you go straight from diesel to renewable energy in the Virgin Islands, the cost of the infrastructure will drive the cost of power up before you can bring the cost of power down. And our economy simply just can't handle that. We're going to take a quick break and come back with you to talk some more and ask you some more questions on GRS, some health care. Decriminalization, no. marijuana status. You guys are really things. putting a lot of pressure on you. Well, that's why you're here. <laughs> I see that. And that's what we do here. So we'll be back in a moment. Back in a moment. Welcome back. We're here with Mr. Kenneth Mapp, who is a gubernatorial candidate for the 2014 general election here in the Virgin Islands. And we've been discussing with him a myriad of issues, and now we're now continuing on. And of course, Yoki is about to ask her the standard question that she asks of every person that comes on the show. <laughs> so, Yoki, take it away. Don't, don't, don't be threatened by it because I'm sure you'll be able to um, handle a it. Nice, beautiful. Lady like you are gonna make me. You're gonna threaten me. <laughs> me? I don't think people are I'm just kidding. Of course. But I want to commend we, we, you. We, we go back. So I want to commend know? you on your hard work. Thank you. And your continual exposure of the development of your product. I see you in Jet Magazine, and this ain't gonna soften the voice. I want to help you. I know that. I tell you that. But I have to commend you because I remember when we were doing the Fredrickson revitalization project, and we were doing the restoration and renovation of the King's Alley Hotel, and we sat, and you were then really in the throes of, of doing your business, and I see from all the articles I read that you're, you're stuck with it, and you have some progress. Now we can stop chipping away at your profits, you can make some money, but Tell me about we'll have a conversation so, yeah. about that another yes, we time. Will. We will. <laughs> As you may have heard recently, Jamaica has um, decriminalized marijuana, Yes. and they're also looking to clear past arrest records. They're looking um, for a to clear past arrest records. Yes, for those who okay. have um, mm -hmm. found with personal possession of marijuana. Um, I'm sure, as you know, within our society, we have where most of our um, legal system and even our jails are, are filled with people who are being held with uh, in jail for you know small simple, simple right simple possession. And um, as a current 30th um, legislature senator is now trying to get. Uh, referendum where we will either decriminalize or legalize so now we're seeing that jamaica has now taken the lead in the caribbean to decriminalize marijuana what is your stance on that position do you see that we should follow jamaica with the decriminalization or do you feel that we should take it a step further with the legalization well i i won't answer let me not answer that in terms of following anybody let's let's i i like to talk about what's good for the virgin islands mm -hmm. Because I think that's how governance should be, be driven. There is no question that the continued war and criminalizing and felonious uh, the use and squandering of resources, chasing the use of marijuana and to some extent the sale of marijuana is is a lost cause. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think the national government, our national government, recognizes that. And certainly, a number of states have gone from medicinal use to, I believe, Colorado, which is practically full Depression. legalization. Mm -hmm. I think the Virgin Islands is ripe for that discussion and to a great extent action. But I think we have to have a discussion about process because we always fail on the process. We get a good idea and then we do it and we don't think of anything in between. Mm -hmm. And I think when, for, let me say, I served in the New York City Police Department for three and a half years and I was a police officer in the Virgin Islands for over seven years. I've seen the worst of human behavior. I've seen the scourge of drugs and, and crime, upfront and personal. 
from my perspective in 2014 and my history and experience in the business of public policy, ultimately I have no objections with the legalization of marijuana. But I don't think we go from where we're at straight there. Because we have a lot of questions to ask. Medicinal use. We have questions to ask about what happens to the folks that have been penalized or are now serving sentences for personal use. What do we do in a legalized society, uh, legaliz in a society where we legalize marijuana, and we have so many young kids on the street who haven't finished school but are excellent entrepreneurs in the sale of marijuana? Do we simply bypass them and say if they have a record, they can't get a license, so we create another environment for somebody to come in and take, get involved in that industry? Or do we find a way to reform the process and get them from being peddlers on the street, hiding and selling marijuana, or get them into pot shops, sort of what's going on in California? There are just a lot of issues that we have to talk about. What kind of revenue potentials do we get from decriminalization and to legalization, and where should that revenue go? How do we implement protections as we have in alcohol and tobacco, where folks under certain ages do not have access and use marijuana, whether they're in their homes or out of their homes, that people are not catering to young people and selling uh, substances that are not good for their health? Uh, so all of these variables, if a bill was to be presented to me, I would not say to you that on its arrival it would be dead. It would have to have a myriad of issues that we would have to, to uh, consider and a number of questions we'd have to answer. And clearly from where we're at today, I don't see how we can legitimately in a process that makes sense for the good of the people of the Virgin Islands go from simply illegal use of marijuana, just sign a bill decriminalizing it, and then two years later sign a bill for legalization, and we haven't dealt with its effect across the society, its, its economic benefit to all of the players in the territory, and how we are going to get to a place where it makes sense that benefits the people of the Virgin Islands. So let me take it a step further then, because it sounds to me that if the perfect bill was presented to you, that you would sign it once everything was met to your liking in terms of yeah i would um, have i would have no objections okay. to doing that so would you be against them and i know we're a government that can create a task force for just about everything and not to even see when the sun rises to when it sets but would you be opposed to creating a task force that would now look into say these same situations that you um spoke about because there are there are valid um yes. concerns you know, especially with the, the medicinal um, aspect of it here. You know, well, would you well, let, something let, like that? Again, let's, let's be honest. Mm -hmm. The conversation on medicinal marijuana is nothing more than another step towards legalization. True. We say, and you're going to hear candidates not only in the Virgin Islands but across America, talk about the medicinal use of marijuana because it gets them to a position where people can't really vilify them <laughs> right but 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 I, but I think we recognize that what yes, the total reality so is and and, and 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 since we know what the total reality is mm -hmm. then we should approach it not in a piecemeal fashion I don't know mm -hmm. that in four years a bill for the legalization of marijuana could be on my desk as governor and get my signature right. because I don't know if the issues that I have raised that are truly of concern to me why would we run young people down, lock them up? And we're talking, let's talk about nonviolent offenders mm -hmm. that are out in the street now selling marijuana and end up with the legalization of marijuana and nobody's going to discuss how do they then become a part of that economic reality that give, take something that they've been running from, hiding from, that we've vilified and be able to convert it to something that is positive. And you can't do that with the stroke of a pen. And, 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 and so task force uh, I, I'm, not a big, study. I, I, I'm not a big fan of task force but I'm a big fan of data and evidence collection and having it synthesized and being able to look at we'll it the bottom line I, I want to leave you with and leave your audience with is Ken Map doesn't have a philosophical opposition to the medicinal use decrim decriminalization or the legalization of marijuana the process by which we achieve them and the affect to the community and the protection of our young mm -hmm. 
and restrictions and revenues and the involvement of giving other folks economic opportunity in that process is important to me. Let me just end this segment of my response by saying to you that this quarter, the U.S. government recognizes where we're going with cannabis and marijuana in this country. How do I know they've recognized where it's going? Well, how do we all know? Because the Department of Treasury and the United States Department of Justice has now made it legal and legitimate for pot shops to have full access and benefits to the financial service sector in America, meaning bank accounts, wire transfers, taking credit cards, mm -hmm. and all the issues that every other legitimate business can. Before uh, those restrictions were listed, owners of pot shops in places like California and Colorado had very limited access to the financial service sector of this nation. Now they have full and unfettered access. So that is a demonstration of where the national government views this issue. And, and Judge Henderson, I did Attorney not. Henderson. Uh, Judge Henderson, Attorney I did not Henderson. have a discussion with Mr. Mark prior to the show regarding his answer because I thought that was a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, we could no, tell no, by your smirk. No, no, yes. because, no, honestly. But you know, but I, you I know, have to agree with you. It was a good answer, you know. So. Because I was tired. I have been tired of people coming here and giving, giving me then those answers that that keep going to the decriminalization side just maybe to they pander. Just, no, I don't think it's pandering. Maybe they have they been felt, pandering. Maybe they felt that that's their answer. You don't agree with it? But you don't. We have a guess. We but won't argue. Answer but what I will say, you are the first candidate uh -huh. that came on the show, and she's asked this to every single one of them. Okay. You're the first one to come on the show that actually brought in the issue mm -hmm. of what do we do with the people who've already been convicted of this and the people Marijuana. who are in the business Marijuana. today. Right. Correct. So look, and no one has talked about that. And so that is very important yeah. because no one has talked about what do we do with them. Because we've made the conversation a simple one. We've mm -hmm. said, you know, let's just legalize pot. And and, and, we, and, and we think and we think of <laughs> no, but we think we, we think of, of, of people who just want to smoke pot. Right. Uh, and we don't think of the reality of what the legalization no. is right. and what requirements for protection, what the economic values are, and what happened to the people who are in the business already. Because it's like gambling. Right. You know, I, I was not for the um, for casino. the casino. Cas legalizing mm -hmm. casino gambling or gaming in the Virgin Islands. I didn't think from the perspective that I was not convinced, and I said it on the floor of the Senate, that the intent of the legislation would materialize in the manner in which we were doing it. The good Lord helped me by the good people of the Virgin Islands voting and electing me as Lieutenant Governor. So I was elevated out of that debate. debate. And, and, and I think in many of the conversations we have, we don't look at these questions from a fundamental perspective of that the issue we're discussing is not an issue to come. That issue is here. Right. That, that, that's, that, that issue was here when I was a police officer. And, and, and it will be here for many years. The question is, are we going to deal with it in a holistic manner? Or we don't piecemeal it simply to appease those who become the louder advocates. Well, this would be a good segue now because from marijuana discussion to our healthcare system. Yes. And how you're going to, uh, through your administration, how are we going to deal with the issues of our hospitals? Mm -hmm. The I see in the governor's financial, uh, in the governor's budget, he's talking about um, once again raising the contribution of government employees for their health care to now a 60 40 wow. split. Um, as though there's any more money that can come from the people, the public um, um, workers. 60-40 on the basis of the 60, employees? 60-40. 40, 40 for the employees, 60 for the government. It's now 65-35. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that the, the Afro Health Care, the Afro Care Act, has, in my view, key provisions that do not apply to us, particularly pre-existing conditions. Mm -hmm. We're in the States. You, um, insurance companies deny can't deny you coverage, but they can do it here unless you're a child. Um, you can you can do it here, and so how are you going to deal with the issues? One of our hospitals, the unfunded liabilities of our hospitals. You are a former commissioner of um, banking and insurance, so I'm sure you have some knowledge about that. But what would be your plan, the Map Potter plan, to deal with our health care in the territory? Well, you asked four I did. or five. I absolutely <laughs> did. Major discussions, mm -hmm. and I want to seg I want to segment them simply because. Timing on a food, I respond Correct. to all of them. Well, here's how I wanted to segment them. 
kind of quick because we have like four more things I want to ask you. Sure. I but I'm not going to sure. spend a lot of time on Okay, it. go ahead. The, the issue of health insurance costs to government employees, retirees, and dependents is a powerful discussion to have because the solution isn't just keep raising the cost of the employee side, but how do we mitigate the increase of cost to the government totally? I am a good example of someone who isn't managing my health well. I'm overweight. One of the things that companies have done in managing their health insurance costs is implement wellness into the policies so that you drive people to eat better, to get away from alcohol, to stop smoking, to exercise, and as the benefits of a healthier life rolls in, to their existence, the cost of their premiums and policies go down because, again, by science and data, we know we add quality years on the end. So we don't have wellness in our health insurance plan for a plan that we're paying $148 million a year. The hospitals are plagued by the reality that we have adopted a necessary policy that persons must receive care notwithstanding their inability to pay. And given, if we give credence to the Health Task Force report that was published by the administration in the last year, they quantify that number to about 32,000. There are provisions of the Affordable Care Act that do not apply to the Virgin Islands. But there are many other provisions that do. Mm -hmm. And the Secretary of Health and Human Services, Catherine Sibillas, wrote a letter to the governors of each of the territory, and in our instant case, Governor DeYoung, and I had the ability to read this letter. And in the secretary's letter, she describes those provisions that are not applicable, but she spent a lot more time describing and discussing the provisions that are applicable and extending a hand to the Virgin Islands of technical and financial assistance for the Virgin Islands to take advantage of those provisions. Part of the... the uh, prevention or, or the inability of us to fully start engrossing ourselves in that act is a claim that our infrastructure platform and technology is inconsistent and unable to communicate well with the whole Medicare system, the health insurance system, as far as communications and scrubbing claims and processing records and all the other things that need to happen. That's not unachievable because all our banks operate on the same platform that all the financial industry of America uh, right operates now. on. So that's not uh, an unachievable reality. How we're going to help the hospitals do better is to be able to drive revenue into the hospitals. And once we do that and we're able to build the confidences, we're going to see that many of the, ex the dollars from health insurance policies and those persons who can pay People won't run to the airport first, they'll stop at the hospital first. The, the, the reality is that I am not in this conversation about, okay, take the hospitals from independent and put them back in the executive branch. I don't know why we have that exercise that if we put somebody to sit over there and it don't work, okay, bring <laughs> them back here and it don't work, okay, put them back over there. We have to get into the fundamental reality and the reality is, is that we have to find financial responsibility and health insurance coverage for those in the territory who are not. And we're going to be able to do that because the, to a great extent because the Affordable Care Act gives us that opportunity. Another thing that the health insurers are doing in the Virgin Islands that uh, many people don't realize is they've now come up with these benchmarks. For example, Cigna, who has a $148 million policy, says to the private sector, well, if you don't have 50 employees, <laughs> I can't sell you a, a policy. Well, well, how many other companies in the Virgin Islands gonna have 50 or more employees? So they, they effectively keep people out. Uh, uh, and, and you have to look at those kinds of, you know, in, in, the, in, the, in the banking industry, we talk about marginalizing neighborhoods and rent lining districts, and the bank come up with a nice, lovely way to say, I'm not gonna lend money over there, or I'm not gonna lend financial services over here. And the health insurance industries are doing the very same thing. And we have to, from a regulatory perspective, be able, and we have the ability, because in health insurance is a highly regulated field, we have the ability to say, well, no, you, you, you can't arbitrarily set a benchmark at 50. And we have to find ways to give people more access to coverage. But if we don't drive dollars in the hospitals, we can't fix the problem. Okay. We just simply cannot. Mr. Mapp, a member of the studio audience asked you a question about small business. Yes. And about 
growing and growing the, the private sector private sector now early on the show we spoke about how this administration the president administration seem to be attacking the working men and women within our territory and it's evident with the budget that's before us how do we how does a map potter administration right size that and make sure that the working men and women are no longer under a threat of i feel that they must retreat from the virgin islands well the the reality is the creation of opportunities and the, the we have very productive good hard-working public and private sector employees but i think that we must recognize that some of the standards that we use aren't as helpful or relevant to what we need to be doing in the overall um, Virgin Islands. And so, Osbert Potter and I are very keen on how we're going to mesh skill and work needed together. How we need to sit with the unions and talk about lateral transfers to have people working in places, not losing any salary or benefits, but working in areas and agencies where their work are important to the sustenance and the quality of the life and health of the citizens in our territory. Mm. And those areas where we don't need to be doing certain things anymore, we just stop doing them. We have to be able to speak to our private sector partners that the platforms and the technology and the infrastructure that they will be rolling out on, you can't be keep coming in and giving us stuff that you have to take off of America and bring here that are, subsid that are inferior and not functional, but charge us the same unit cost for the product and the services that you're charging. We have the largest broadband capacity on the North American continent, save New York and New Jersey, which has more. The Virgin Islands is at the bottom of the list when it comes to internet access and speed. Now, how do you mesh such the uh, ability of an infrastructure? The government puts over 200 million in the ground for connectivity, and yet the IP providers in the territory, I, don't, I ain't picking on one. Hmm. <laughs> they, they, could, they could advertise, I got 8 megabytes um, per minute or per second, and 8 megabytes per second in today's world of internet access is now uh, and it, inferior. And the charging so we, premium. Well, well and, 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 and so my whole point is it, it, the work is on all sides. And it's not about beating down on folks and being critical and just attacking folks, but how do we get folks to the table and we begin to say, listen, this is the action plan and this is what is going to be required of you because at the end of the day, if we don't build this economy and change the way we conduct business, we cannot, we cannot get to a better quality of life for anyone in the territory. The entire middle class of the Virgin Islands is rapidly disappearing. People in the middle class have no options but to take their families and leave. That's leaving a community of folks that, that, that need help against a community of folks that have a lot of wealth. Mm -hmm. And the mix of those two is not a good mix in a society. So we have to get back into how we're going to reinvest and build our infrastructure and begin to create real opportunity that we can build back up the middle class and become functional as a territory and become competitive in our region and on the global stage. We're going to take a quick break um, and have you come back and ask a few more questions and then allow you to wrap up. We'll be back in a moment. Welcome back. We are here with Kenneth Mack. Um, Kenneth, uh, Mr. Mack, call me Ken, you know. Okay, Ken. We usually have another co-host, uh, Mr. Boyd McFarlane, but he's off tonight. And he also asks a standard question sure. of every person. And his question is usually on your stance on our status okay. and your stance on reparations. Okay. I, the status is an issue that really should be driven as part of the development of a constitution. I personally don't have a whole lot of, it's not a sort of like a priority in the, in the maze of all of the issues that are occurring. 
is status is an issue that should be driven and must always be driven by the will of the people of this territory because status means relationship with the United States whether we want to sort of stay in the nebulous state that we are whether we want to step away from or we want to step closer to and all of the variance in that movement is codified under the whole issue of status and at this point he would interject and say well which one <laughs> well I, I I am a I I am a happy American I believe that we have a lot of opportunity as being a part of the United States of America we benefit from a lot of opportunities I think many of our children are fully integrated if you go into our cemeteries many 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 Virgin Islanders has laid their life down not by draft but by volunteering their service to this nation and I think it's a conversation for the community to have and to develop that position. I like the freedom of going anywhere I want in America, and when I don't have to run for public office and I have the time voting anywhere in America. I think my history sort of reflects that <laughs> as well. I'm I I I am more right now consumed uh, and concerned with the immediacy of where we're at in the Virgin Islands and the opportunity that it gives us to build a path to a better quality of life. And in that path, the whole issue of a constitution and the people's power to their elected officials and subsequently the discussion of relationship with the United States, that conversation should come. Reparations? The issue of rep reparation is another interesting one. Um, I'm, I'm not fully engrossed into reparations. I hear the debate. I see the disappointment. I see the frustration. I think. Uh, again, given where we're, we're at, it, you know, those that, that, that push for it, those that advocate for it, I am very happy to give them an open audience and to, to teach me more about it. Uh, but again, the immediacy of the issues in the Virgin Islands, it's not, um, it's, it, I'm not saying it's not important. It, it's, it's, right, it's right now not high on the issues confronting a new administration. Let me, if I, if I may interject, with the first half of the question that we asked in terms of status, um, to further expand on that, how would you see our role in the Caribbean? Because me, I tell everybody, first and foremost, I'm a Caribbean person. Yes. I know the Caribbean culture. I don't know the American culture, yes. even though we fly the flag. Yes. You know? But when you look at us throughout the rest of the Caribbean, we are not even considered Caribbean people. Well, so how <laughs> we're not well, you know we, well, there's a well, lot of stuff that we cannot deal with and the interaction well, is very difficult well, you know so do you see where uh, we should uh, have more uh, 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 <laughs> uh, my grandfather and my mother's side <laughs> and my grandparents on my father's side and my aunts and uncle on my father's side are all hardcore Barbadians mm -hmm. I know about cuckoo and flying fish <laughs> my grandmother is really out of just Van Dyke my mother's mother and long compatriots of Fusions and Syntomians mm -hmm. make up my aunts and uncles. I traveled the Caribbean and even in my work in the private sector and I could sit down anywhere in the Caribbean and be just as home and people just as comfortable with me. I, I, I think we, we I look at these things through different lenses. I'm looking the, more from the a ability, business standpoint because well, well, it's, it's very difficult and I can speak well, to well, it. Because, yes, you know, it's the, those are business. barriers to trade. And, and, and even that's economic a development, even with economic development, because we're black from a lot of the stuff that even those who are not nations who are in the same sort of political stance as we are sort of from participating in because well, we, we, fly we, the we flag don't and, like get, said, we don't get, we don't, we don't have the legal legitimate ability mm -hmm. to interact in the <coughs> Caribbean as if we're an island nation. We, we don't have uh, foreign affairs responsibility as a territory, nor if we were a state. Uh, how can we participate and get the State Department to be sensitive to those issues in the region and how they affect us uh, is really our charge. Uh, but, but as a part of a larger nation, you know, we, we, don't, we don't do that. Our interaction as Caribbean people and our life and our living as Caribbean people across the Caribbean is very fundamental. Mm -hmm. We are a hodgepodge of Caribbeanness and and even don't don't care how many of us or how many of us go anywhere and study any particular discipline and and become very proficient and good at it whether we're in Barbados or we come from the Virgin Islands or we come from Puerto Rico our ability to come back home and sit down in our home and be very comfortable with each other and live in our culture and our traditions and norms are without dispute so so 
my, my, I bristle because I again the lens I see these issues through are, are, are real and our ability to bridge ties I mean we, we, we used to have the uh, Puerto Rican uh, uh, friendship and we stand on two mountains and we try on battle after one another so we don't <laughs> sort of celebrate that anymore and then we had our conflicts in terms of fishing and the ability of Virgin USVI fishermen to be fishing in areas around the BVI and the arrest and the seizure of boats in that has created the, the BVI friendship. friendship thing around August to be another bristling effect so our ability to sort of mesh and and use our connectivity to the United States and the State Department and figure out how we can be more comfortable in our region and neighborhood and be able to participate and take part is a, is a, is a responsibility we need to pursue. What I want you to answer uh, quickly um, is the issue with the GRS system. Yes. And the fact that you have uh, a group of people who are on the brink of having no money and that they're living right now not I'm not, I'm living right now unsure unsecured as to, unsecured as to their retirement what do you have or what do you believe how you're going to tackle that issue um if you are elected governor of the virgin islands well uh, a, a little voice in the back of my head said do not govern in a campaign so i, I have to pull back the answer we're going to just give <laughs> but um we have to change the way we manage the grs we, we really do and we have to have folks sort of on the board we have a, I think, a deeper depth. Everybody on the board is not bad. That's, that's not what I'm saying. But it, we need some additional people on the board that have a real, deep, vast understanding of public finance and what opportunities come out in the office of public debt and when they can seize upon opportunities. And that if something, if somebody selling a car for two thousand dollars, and you lend them ten thousand dollars and said. You could secure the note, the ten thousand dollar note with that two thousand dollar car, that you should know you're gonna get paid. You, 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 you don't need an actuary to tell you that. You should know that. So we have to stop doing those kinds of things. And I think it comes down fundamentally to on all of the the instrumentalities of the people we ask to serve on the board of commissions. We have people that would be extremely beneficial to the GRS board that wouldn't even want the stipend but could not serve because the limit of liability as a director is a million dollars and these people own managing multi-billion dollar funds and hedge funds and and businesses that worth hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars but how much would it cost us if we said you can't sue them except for willful negligence and you you, you give them uh, some level of immunity the access of that kind of advice so you have directors insurance that are significantly more than a million dollars. So there, 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 there are opportunities in the market without me being overly specific in what I hope are the few minutes remaining uh, because I don't want to put my plan out right now. But there are opportunities in the market and we use them in the public finance authority, let me say, to completely recover 14 years of negative earnings on the investment of our bond proceeds. And there were many, many, many millions of dollars that were recovered. Okay. Well, what I will say for you, um, you know, I really enjoyed having you on the show. I'm sure Clint enjoyed definitely coming. enjoyed having you on the show, <laughs> since he seemed to agree with everything that you said. And um, <laughs> and so I, we're I, you, you, you kind of caught me with a blow too, you know. I mean, yeah, I, I, I like, know. But I didn't back up. You have to watch it on a show so no way I said okay, what I said I about him. Do that. <laughs> but <laughs> luckily for you, yes. you are guaranteed to return after the primary okay. on, on our show. As you know, we're going to have calling back those individuals who are going to be in the general election this time they come back with their running mates and we'll talk with the running mates at that point sure. uh, for those who are in the democratic primary um you know we don't know who's going to come back so for those individuals we said to stop it we said to them we said to them you know if you win then we will call you back but you I'll go directly you. Okay, to the general election, okay. and yes. so you yeah, will we're, be we're, back we're after independent August. candidates correct we're not in the primary as my partner and i are not in the primary we're running as independents um, ours but Pata come from the Democratic Party and folks know that when Santa Claus was in grammar school I used to be a registered Republican right <laughs> right and well you know but there's no law that prohibits people from mixed um, As we know, I'm so a registered they, independent they, they, and so well, you're a registered independent he's a registered independent That's right. and so you all are going straight to the general election so you all will be back on the show after yes. 
yes. the primaries. primaries when we know who all is going to be there. Yes. This time with your running mates, and we'll have much more intensive questions, and hopefully you'll have your plan at that time that you want to disclose More intense than why I went to tonight. Oh, yeah. 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 Tonight, this was just a teaser. <laughs> this was not anything major, but thank you for coming on. Thank you for show. having me. Thank you so I much. I really appreciate it. Please let everyone know where they can find you if they want to ask more questions. or they have so Certainly on, on St. Croix, our headquarters is in uh, St. Peter's Rest, across from Cossiles. In St. Thomas, we're at the Lockhart Gardens. Uh, and in St. John, we're at the Lumberyard. Uh, you'll find us there. We're going to be publishing the websites uh, very shortly. Uh, and, and we're going to be doing a big ad campaign on that. We're all over social media. Uh, uh, so you can find us there. The, 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 in ending or, or saying um, good night for, 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 the, for the time being, uh, Osbert Parter and I come to the people of the Virgin Islands to offer them leadership, to offer them a stable way of looking at our issues in a real way and providing solutions that go directly to the problems that are affecting us. It is really going to be a basic choice whether we want to move in a different direction or whether we want more of the same. I want to make it clear that Osbert and I have been saying to the people of this territory that we know that there are people across the public sector that are contributing value that work hard and it doesn't make a difference if you're in the administration today that simply because a new administration come in that your skills and services will not be utilized or we will not give you an opportunity to work we do not believe in this business that if people don't support you they should be punished and if people work in another administration they should not have access to work we don't we don't believe that and we're not promoting that. But the way in which we conduct our affairs and manage our affairs, our ability, or what appears to be to some extent a lack of ability to sit with folks in the private sector and negotiate on a fair exchange of value to grow our economy, to create opportunity, to get rid of many of the social ills that plague us it what is what have us in this quagmire. And we are committing to the people of the territory that we're going to sit down, that we're focused, we're energetic and we're ready to go and we need your vote and your support on November 4th. Well, thank you so much again thank for being on VI Voices. Thank you. Um, here at VI Voices, you know we have our Rock Your Voice campaign in which we want to make sure that you are informed and that you are informed fully. That you have an opportunity to ask questions of those who are asking for your vote. It is your right to ask them those kinds of questions and anybody who doesn't want to answer your questions you should look at them with with some glare and and to figure out whether or not they really should be individuals that should get your vote we are living in a community in times where we need to really have answers to our to our problems a time where we actually need to look for towards hope and responsibility of our and accountability for those individuals who are seeking office and so we're asking you that you go out you register to vote if you are not registered if you are in fact registered that you go out and you vote and that you ask questions understand that your voices are important and they need to be heard good night everybody